Hey everyone, welcome in to Patterns Tell Stories. This is the second episode of the Alaskan Dark Pyramid. Hope you all enjoy it. So they did, there is a liter, like an actual USGS study, you know, the journal Nature saying during this fucking nuclear test, they found a fucking structure. The problem is, is that this structure is 2,700 miles under the surface. And there's no fucking way in hell <laughs> that, you know, Western Electric drilled down fucking 3,000 miles to like the core of the earth. You know what I mean? So, right, right. It's going to be at, at a depth that we can, that we can get to if there's actual people like working on it. This, this is proof that they found something underground during that nuclear test. That in and of itself is, is very interesting because one of the main skeptical talking points against this is like they couldn't have found something but the fact is that they found something when, so when people talk about alaska there's uh they always mention harp which is like the uh what's it stand for high frequency active auroral research program h-a-a-r-p and it's a university of alaska fairbanks program which researches the ionosphere the highest ionized part of the earth's atmosphere well that it does exist and that's in Alaska, but someone wrote in and asked Linda Howe if that had to do with any of this. And she was pretty confident. No, she was like, no, this is different than what I'm talking about. She, she and she clarified. I think her opinion is that this has to do with something very ancient. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that it, it has to do if people are going that direction on this one. I don't think that's what that's doing, because there's a bunch of conspiracies around harp. I don't think harp is like sinister at all. Sorry. I feel like I just took us on a weird tangent. No, you're good. But I uh, yeah, sometimes uh, when people toss around Alaska, that's that's one of the things that I do know people know about Alaska when you talk about UFOs is like uh, people think something's up with heart. Jesse Ventura did a whole episode on it on his conspiracy theory show. And it was cool. I would I don't know what's going on there. It seemed like it. There's nothing to see here type place. But then when he went over there, they told him it was all classified. And he was like, why is it classified if it's like supposed to be for research program? And uh, I don't know. It was a real interesting episode. It's been proven that there's been disinformation campaigns when it comes to the UFO subject. And Tom kind of talks about how it's always like the third thing. And the example he gives is like Roswell. Was it a balloon? No. Was it, you know, so then people think, is it an extraterrestrial flying saucer? And then there's a third thing, which he talks about being, you know, a uh, advanced Nazi craft from Argentina. So he always says it's the third thing. So I think it's interesting to think about this, like, especially when it comes to harp, like is harp a conspiracy theory covering for another conspiracy theory? Yeah, dude, that's a really good comparison. Because <laughs> like, uh, I, I think he said that he thought that people behind these secrets made the conspiracy that we didn't go to the moon. And he said that, like, the, there's the idea that we did go to the moon and then they put the idea out there that we didn't go and they faked it. And then he's like, but what's the third thing of yeah, what's that, on that's, the moon? That's what it was. Yeah. yeah, dude, I thought that was sick. And it was a good way of describing it because, like, there is stuff that, like, we come to find out is baloney. And then people end up having to, like, take chapters out of books and, like, it yeah people have egg on their faces a lot on a lot of these because like they'll buy the cover or they'll uh really bank on it being either which way when all, all the evidence doesn't come out yet I, but we have seen that quite a few times what do you think it is do you think it's some ancient shit do you think it's like something that is really 2700 miles do you think it's something people are taking elevators to like when you think about know, it man. what do you think I'm, I'm real curious to like see what your opinion is on that given like all that information i just find it really interesting that they did find something under alaska because of that nuclear blast no one seems to want to acknowledge that, <laughs> you know, even, even if it is that far down and it's impossible for us to reach. I mean, just the fact that that's possible, that that's where I come at these things um, is that, you know, what is, what is possible? Like, is it possible that this is there and what, how can I prove that these possibilities are, are real? There's a higher probability that it's true because this was proven. 
and then it, it gives you reason enough to keep pursuing that that rabbit hole whereas like you you're you know you get hit with stuff that's like okay this is obviously bullshit i'll stop thinking about it um and talking about it and making an ass of myself basically and i'll right. you know for this specific rabbit hole i i think there's a 90 percent chance i'm gonna hit that wall and look like an idiot but <laughs> until that time uh yeah let's keep going I wanted to ask you uh, about when you were researching the uh, coordinates in the Monsters of California movie. I, I know that we talked about uh, what John Keel called window areas. And it's like interesting parts of our planet that have weird like magnetic anomalies happening. And you said it's also a spot that people have uh, not a spot, but it's an example. It's a term he used for parts of our planet that had a lot of uh specific magnetic abnormalities to them and he was saying how like an area like stonehenge was an example and he said that the people in the area of stonehenge he, he called it a 14 cycle of 9.6 years and he he said that that was like the cycle that the locals of that area observed whatever event stonehenge was meant to commemorate a lot of those types of areas are notorious for having UFO sightings and uh, men in black sightings. You know, I wonder when you were looking at that area of Alaska, what do you think like is in Alaska? Do you think Alaska is a window area? You always hear about people like, I don't know if that's just my dumb Southern understanding of Alaska, but like, I, I understand Alaska to be a like kind of mysterious place. I picture a lot of woods and an, I picture like people like going missing and shit that my question basically is like, did you find anything interesting about where Alaska is like electromagnetically? The, the coordinates in, in Tom's movie, I was actually like really surprised by how close it was to where I, I had been looking previously. So I use this, uh, it's the NOAA um, EMAG2 magnetic anomaly map. And I've used it for a while. And uh, it's basically like it overlays onto Google Earth and it shows you all the magnetic anomalies that, that are on Earth pretty much. So you can see like... You know, certain places that that are notorious for kind of UFO sightings, like Cat Catalina Island has like like deep blue in a certain area next to it. So that's like that's actually where Lou Elizondo went in an episode of Unidentified to go kind of look for UFOs was in that area uh, where that where that blue section is. Um, and you can see it on the EMAG anomaly map on Google Earth, uh, that specific location. So there is a kind of pyramidal looking structure. It's like a square that's like, it's in the middle of um, all this green is a red square that gets progressively more red the more you go in the center of it. So it looks like a fucking pyramid pretty much kind of next to uh, the Denali mountain range. Yeah, it's it's kind of where, where I've looked for a while now. And the fact that it was so close, it's, a, it's within like maybe 20 miles of, of the coordinates in Tom's movie. I posted it a bunch on um, on Twitter, and I'll I'll retweet it on the uh, Patterns Tell Stories uh, Twitter account. It's it should be on there, but if not, I'll I'll post it there too. Yeah, I mean it's pretty clearly like a square. I don't know, maybe it's just some sort of artifact. I mean, totally could be, but uh, it's pretty blatant and obvious that it looks like a pyramid. Everything I hear about Alaska has this like air of mystery to it. I know Ingo Swan talked about it in his book Penetration. He yeah, talk, it's a crazy he tells story. that crazy story. I think we actually d talked about that in one episode. The UFO but I could be, like, coming out of the water and like yeah. sucking, up, sucking up water and fucking like zapping trees and shit. <laughs> fucking squirrels getting fucking. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's wild. So I don't know what the fuck is going on in Alaska, but like. The stories I hear out of there are something else. Yeah. So the the one other part of this story where Tom comes in is the suppressing consciousness part. And that's that's where shit gets weird. What do you think that means? I don't know if I've asked you that, but like when they say he I I've always noticed that Tom never says or in the, what I've seen of him, he doesn't say human consciousness. He just says suppressing consciousness. It's like kind of like a fantastic way of describing it, yeah. of saying like uh, suppressing consciousness, because like that could mean all sorts of things depending on what you describe consciousness as. But I know that Tom has also talked about like proxy wars and like 
different types of intelligences or consciousnesses are competing with each other. And I wondered if like maybe the pyramid is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe the, maybe the pyramids are like suppressing like maybe pyramids are good. Maybe they're like suppressing a bad consciousness and they were created by some ancient, I don't know. I'm just like spitballing because like, I feel (laughs) like the way he described it still leaves a lot of questions. And like, I would be real interested to see if he, he, and the disappointing thing is he didn't seem to want to get into the weeds on it at all. Like he was just like, yeah, let's just kind of leave it alone. Like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Talking about remote viewing, uh, there was this really interesting uh, report from Ingo Swan from the 1996, where he and a bunch of other remote viewers uh, tried to remote view a structure underneath the pyramids of Giza. And this kind of, if you think of this in the context of, you know, this pyramid under Alaska, it kind of starts to bring things together in addition to um, a few other things that were written about by Joseph Farrell that I'm going to kind of go over after this. But uh, I just want to read part of this. Um, these, These are some of the comments from the remote viewers who tried to look at something under the Pyramid of Giza. There, it seems to be more than just something that's in Egypt. It seems to be a kind of global thing. Yeah, just try to think of this in the context of Alaskan Pyramid. Uh, As I view this, I don't get a sense of travel or traveling of any kind, but I do get a sense of network as if Out there in the universe is a network of pathways or lanes of some kind. Nothing seems to be happening, but I get a sense that I'm receiving, no, not receiving, coexisting with information, as we might call it. No, not information, just coexisting with something, as if I'm I'm in a data bank of some kind, rather joined into one. I now see net extends out into other parts of the world as if the planet itself is centered in one of these horizontal perpendicular gyroscope things i have a feeling that thousands of pictures are downloading so fast i can't see them individually the data dump comes to mind i arrive at the area where i'm supposed to be and become temporarily overwhelmed with the impression of great technology and power But this is not a central control area. Actually, this is one of many such rooms, caverns, and chambers which are interconnected and in the gestalt form, what we would call a much larger control facility. But that is not what this is all about. Control is only a secondary role. I know these separate facilities are spread all over Earth and at several extraterrestrial locations. A sentient being at the site does not maintain any type of communication with any other humans and speaks with his host the same way they speak with each other, something like ESP, but much more complex and much more complete. Uh, I see a room at the end. It seems to be lit. I'm going into the room, high ceiling, pillars around the edge of the room, two pillars at the other end. I feel them. They are alive. Machine intelligence matrix. Um, So the monitor asks, what is the information? And the viewer says, this intelligence has been there for not constant. It comes and goes a long, long, long time. It wants whomever to know that they're very much still there. They have decided that they are going to try to communicate. They just want their presence known. This intelligence has quite a bit of authority. It could be very destructive if it wanted to. I have another idea. Standing back from Earth, these balls of light are inside hills and mountains. There are a lot of them. The monitor asks, what is the function of the balls? The viewer says, they are all more or less equal. The one in the chamber is more or less the spokesperson. They are in touch with each other. They are waiting for instructions. I don't get a bad feeling from them. They are inside hills and mountains. This is the first attempt to show themselves. So it sounds like there's some sort of network of energy, a matrix between different structures that I guess are are megaliths. That's what these remote viewers are saying and that there is information passing between them. And there might actually be more other structures off planet that are connected to this to this matrix or network as well. And it sounds like <laughs> they are quote unquote balls, or they sound like orbs basically that are that are connected to the structure. And they they are inside hills and mountains. They're waiting for instructions and they're in touch with each other. And this is the first attempt to show themselves. That's what that's what comes in from from this remote viewing session of, of a structure under the Giza pyramid. Damn, bro. 
that's uh <laughs> This episode's fucking a lot. Because uh, <laughs> I was going to ask you about H.P. Lovecraft. He would talk about all sorts of shit. Like he'd talk about the great old ones and he'd talk about Cthulhu. And then he would talk about uh, like underground cities and Necronomicons and all this shit. One of the stories he tells about an underground city, he describes these like basalt bridges. And it's like... Uh, they said, at any rate, when the men of Kenyan went into fuck, I don't want to go into like essentially he describes these like shapeless uh, beings and energies and like these things that like uh, I was just getting like shadow biosphere vibes as I was reading what he was saying. And then I was like, well, fuck, I'm just going to ask you about the shadow biosphere. Shadow biosphere is kind of like it's not really like inner dimensional but it could mean you know a different kind of life form that's like maybe energy i think keel even said that like maybe when we were fucking around with like nukes that we discovered some sort of you know nuclear life i think was the quote he used i find that to be very interesting like nuclear life could come in the form of like orbs or or something like that or like kind of earth lights that they talk about like conscious balls of light there's this one book uh it's it has to do with earth lights and it basically says that these are very short-lived balls of energy that are sort of sentient yeah keels keels called them living lights yeah like that's that's the phrase he uses for them people think that the story is always a saucer so like keel would keel's favorite type of person to interview um, would be a type one sighting he called and a type one sighting was like someone of standing in the community like a police officer or a judge or a doctor he said in a lecture that he would really focus on type one encounters and another element of a type one encounter um, if I remember correctly was that it would be someone that came very close with a UFO. Uh, these these people would describe an encounter with like an organized blob of light. It it would almost like come into existence and come out of existence, not really fly into their uh, backyard or anything. You know what I'm saying? Like as this thing comes in or out of existence, they'll describe it going along that Roy G. Biv color spectrum mm -hmm. that our our eyes can detect. Oftentimes they would be in strange areas of the earth he called window areas that were more prone to this type of phenomena for whatever reason. But yeah, John Keel was the man. And in my opinion, he was like ahead of his time. When I hear guys like John Keel talk about it or Jacques Vallée, it seems, or Diana Pasolka even, she's like given really interesting takes on this subject. Um, and not all of these people align 100%. But they certainly talk about it in a way that has to relate to our consciousness and uh, who we are as human beings. Yeah, I don't know. The orb thing seems very interesting. And uh, I'm not sure if I'd, if I'd like to experience that because of the biological effects that appear to happen. I mean, when you read you know, Skinwalkers, the Pentagon, there just seems to be all sorts of fucked up like immune system problems people get that one story where the orb like went into the dude's fucking arm and like out his chest or whatever. And he got like super sick. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a nightmare to me. God damn. It sounds like Voldemort. <laughs> yeah. Straight up. Like, oh, holy God. shit. <laughs> so there's one, one more uh, theory on this, like kind of suppressing consciousness idea. It was brought forward by this um, German scientist. I think he's still around. He's an engineer called, um, his name is Constantine Mayl, M-E-Y-L. Uh, he published uh, an actual textbook on these things called scalar waves, or um, they're also known as Tesla waves. Tesla was actually experimenting with scalar waves in the 1890s. It's interesting when you think about it, because you know his shit got really suppressed. So these scalar waves weren't aren't really considered. They're considered like kind of pseudoscience, uh, just because they haven't been looked into. So the engineer was a German professor of engineering. Constantine Mayo and his research was nothing less than stunning. How else could one make sense of some statements in classical texts that Roman Empire functionaries at distant regions of the empire would send to the emperor for instructions and receive an answer at the latest the following night? Uh, Mayo's answer is simply that there was a technology in play, religious temples. 
<laughs> so basically this male guy goes through and um says like religious temples and like their towers were constructed with the golden ratio they were used as antennas for like radio broadcasting between between these religious structures farrell goes on to speculate further and he says um the results were astounding and here it is necessary to comment on them because they are directly germane to the thesis being examined here, namely that these temples might also have functioned not only as transmitters and receivers for microwaves, but as mind manipulation environments. For the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, for example, the calculation of the frequency of the building uh, was to be 5 megahertz. For the Temple of Athena, it was 7.5 megahertz. For the Temple of Apollo, it was 9 megahertz. For the Temple of Venus in Roma, 6.8 megahertz. Why are these results so interesting? Because if one understands the laws of harmonics, they are all harmonics, the alpha and theta wave states of the brain. Uh, and then he goes on to list like the resonance cycles. And um, to put it succinctly in those cases examined by mail, not only are we dealing with microwave transmitters and receivers, but with structures that appear to have been deliberately designed to induce alpha or theta, both states of mind, states of relaxed alertness or a hypnagogic state or a state of mind somewhere between the two. The same technology based on pulsed radio waves was also engineered to produce various emotional states for anyone inside the structures. So in answer to the question of whether such technology existed and whether it was ever deployed to manipulate the mental and emotional environment, our answer must be a tentative yes. But was that technology ever used in more overt ways and displays to manipulate the minds of men? Was it ever used to mold an entire religious consciousness? <laughs> so basically, Farrell is speculating here that these religious structures uh, like temples were built specifically with the golden ratio to act as waveguides for these different scalar waves to be transmitted between the temples and could have also been used as mind manipulation, you know, transmitter and receivers, and that the calculations that male made basically correspond to the alpha and theta uh, wave states of the brain. So they could basically use them to suppress consciousness. <laughs> I feel like that correlates pretty strongly with what John Keel talked about in pretty much all of his books. He talks about this idea. One of the things he says in Our Haunted Planet about um, these like weird areas, he, he says, a leading authority on mythology and mysticism, poet Robert Graves, recently stated, there are some sacred places made so by the radiation created by magnetic ores. My village, for example, is a kind of natural amphitheater enclosed by mountains containing iron ore, which makes a magnetic field. Most holy places in the world, holy not by some accident, like a hero dying or being born there, are of this sort. Delphi was a heavily charged holy place. And then Kiel continues, back in the Middle Ages, the Vatican pointedly ordered that new churches should be constructed on the sites of old temples whenever possible. The tradition of sacred places runs deep and seems to be largely based upon the continuous observations of paranormal manifestations. The entities who allegedly approached human beings in miraculous events frequently ordered a church or temple to be built on the spot. But we didn't need an order to erect the great churches at Lourdes or Fatima after the entities appeared there. Remember the legendary 19-year cycle of Stonehenge when the god was supposed to appear? Multiply the 14 cycle of 9.6 years by two. Yeah, and then he talks about the U.S. carries out a magnetic survey. Like we were talking about earlier, they show all sorts of these clusters. So it's just like, I thought that that clip from... Our Haunted Planet is one of the most interesting. And even that number um, that he gave of 9.6, I've asked many people that I really like respect their opinion on of that number. And that's something that I've never seen in another book. And he talks about it like so confidently. And I know he was like a huge fan of Charles Ford. So I don't think he like pulled it out of his ass, but yeah, I would like, I'd be curious to research more about that. They, that that's a real interesting clip that i feel like is pertinent to what we're talking about it's very interesting he told he said they were instructed to build churches on the sites of old temples just the idea that there's like this grid of certain places across the world where a lot of these megaliths are 
that there potentially was energy being transferred or along this grid that I think that might be what Tom's talking about when he talks about suppressing consciousness is some sort of energy grid kind of keeps us in a certain frequency. And then that kind of ties in with the Schumann resonance. And maybe that's a control system. And then you think about what Edgar Mitchell says about leaving, leaving earth and um, kind of the consciousness and the, and the psi experiments he conducted, you know, maybe outside of this, this energy grid, we can, we can kind of raise our consciousness because we're not contained within it. Though, and that's another point that Keel mentioned was like these things, when we say balls of light, he would say that they're intelligent energy. Part of that was that in a lot of these areas where these things are happening, they'll have power failures. I'm probably paraphrasing, but the way that like some of these manifestations appear is like they draw energy from the surrounding, I guess you could say like electricity, like, like power anything. Lines and yeah, shit, right? exactly. And like you'll you'll hear stories about like how their car engine was fried for a second the uh or you have like missing time i feel like they have to interrelate in some special way or like it's a particular technology that's causing these things to happen and we just don't understand it yet like that quote like any advanced enough technology is indistinguishable from magic i feel like that's applying really heavily to humans and ufos we don't know what to make of them so our explanation is pretty much magic the guys like joseph farrell they really get into the weeds of like why is this site special why is the oracle at delphi special you know like why is the <laughs> temple of zeus special we mentioned him in earlier episodes but andrea puharik he was a fan of going to these different sites and measuring abnormalities that were there. And one of the interesting things Farrell kind of talks about and that he says his research has shown is that like the further back you go in time, the more impressive these structures are. You'd think that progress would happen forward, but <laughs> yeah, you know, per perhaps something was more advanced than the civilizations we, we even know about. It harkens back to uh, Graham Hancock saying that we're a species with amnesia. You know, like that, that so many questions are swirling around. Well, another problem with this stuff is that archaeologists base their theories on what they think people of the time were capable of. But it's like, what if they weren't constructed by the people of the time that you think they were? That opens up a whole fuckload of possibilities when you just constrict yourself to a certain era you know a lot of shit comes off the table and less and less stuff makes sense if you keep open the idea that maybe something happened before it pieces might start to fall into place a little more when we talk about like being a species with amnesia what do you think about like the cycles of man and like i've heard from a couple different sources like making the speculation uh that human beings like like the chan thomas idea I think he touches on this. We're in cycles of civilizations. Do you ascribe more to that? Or do you think that there's like a, a swirl like of that. all sorts of shit? Yeah, it kind of uh, does to me. And that's what Tom says, too. Uh, he said it like back in 2017. You know, maybe we're a little older than we thought. Civilizations, maybe they rise and fall potentially in cycles. I don't know, man. That's a scary thought because it makes you wonder when the next cycle starts or the cycle, the cycle ends and the next one starts and what what that mechanism is that you know is in between each one damn <laughs> <laughs> happy halloween turn yeah off, happy halloween everybody <laughs> turn off that fucking pyramid uh the world <laughs> is um could use it right about now <laughs> yeah. oh man i think uh yeah i think we got into a lot of shit um is there more more you wanted to uh, go over? But I don't I don't think so, dude. I think we covered a lot of content right there, and that's a lot to chew on. For <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh uh, God, I did a lot of research that I was supposed to do uh, for the article that, that I'm supposed to write. So. <laughs> um, so I hope people enjoyed this one. Um, a lot went into it, but uh, for every single time, like. I forget to mention, you know, shit like uh, we have a Twitter account at Patterns Podcast. So please follow that for any updates. And I'm going to start posting the shit we actually that we talk about on the podcast. I'm going to start posting that on the Twitter account so people can actually look and see that we're not we're not making all this shit up. It actually exists. So, yeah, I'm going to try to be better about that. And then we also have a Patreon 
that is on our link tree, which is on the Patterns Podcast Twitter account bio. I put up a kind of bonus episode. Um, <laughs> we we recorded an episode like a like a month or so ago and got interrupted, so it wasn't really uh, a full podcast. But I put it up there anyway, you know, as an extra kind of gift for anyone who wants to support us. And yeah, what do you got? Anything? Um, not particularly, but I'm, I promise something soon is going to be pretty exciting because I do have something in the works right now. Yeah. I'll leave it at that, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Cool, man. Um, yeah, I just wanted to express like appreciation for people who are talking about this, the show and it sounds like people like it. So that's pretty rad. Thanks for giving us a chance and uh, checking it out. We kind of ramble sometimes, but uh, I don't know. I think we we kind of fill in a niche that, you know, people were kind of looking for. So, and it's fun to do. We have fun conversations. Yeah, that was the thing. I wanted to make a list of all the books that we mention on the show, because I think that would be a really cool thing <laughs> for people to, because like a lot of people just go like, well, where did you get that information? Where did you get that? That way people can actually point back to something and be like, yeah, I actually learned it from this author and this is where they cited it, you know, and it makes th things a little less foggy. Whereas I feel like there's so much of people just making really spectacular claims and not backing it up. Yeah, I think that would be a, a, a fun trend because like my Twitter, I really try not to like, <laughs> I do poke back and forth with people occasionally or people will like uh, say real rude things and stuff but like <laughs> at the end of the day i like to just post books that's my favorite thing is just post a clip of one of the books that i'm reading because it doesn't really give you an opinion it just gives you a blurb of something that like really might spark you like that's a big reason why i started reading john keel is because that 14 uh Corey that we mentioned before he was like always posting about him and i asked him like hey what's what's up with this book and he's like yeah this is this author he writes these and then like i don't know it was really cool to uh learn about ufos that way of like kind of just reading what authors have said about it i feel like it gives you a more informed take on what we're talking about because so much of it i feel like so much research has been done on these topics it's just people's ability to discern what is reliable and what is not reliable has really just been getting like eroded because of yeah. all the obfuscation and transparency issues so hopefully uh, people just collectively start talking and like backing up what they say and saying where they got this information and that can maybe help us find out what what exactly is rotten in the fridge when we're opening the fridge and smell something like we know that something's going on with obfuscation and transparency and how many things are classified i think that that's another reason it's super important to support people like commander fravor and ryan graves and uh, dave grush when they come forward and try to talk and they can't even get a skiff I don't know, like people really got to look around of like, who's trying to get us more transparency on this topic we so desperately need. And I saw those people under oath testifying in front of Congress, like literally putting everything on the line for who they are. Yeah, get that Kirkpatrick mayonnaise out of the back and Hell yeah. ch chuck it in the fucking trash. <laughs> But yeah, bro. I think that's a good way to cap it. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, uh, for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, guys. 